1964, like so many years in the 60s, was filled with events we will not soon forget. The Warren Commission released its findings on the assassination of President Kennedy, but Americans continued to grieve his loss. News reports were filled with accounts of civil rights demonstrations and the escalation of American involvement in Vietnam. Martin Luther King received the Nobel Peace Prize that year, and President Johnson signed the most extensive civil rights law since the days of Reconstruction. In Rome, the bishops of the church met for the third session of the Second Vatican Council, and already the effects of that council were being noticed as Americans celebrated the sacraments for the first time in English. Ralph Loker was the mayor of Cleveland then, and Edward F. Hoban was the bishop of the Cleveland Diocese. Tucked away in the sweep of this nation's history that year was a decision by Archbishop Hoban which is still having an impact on the Catholics in the Cleveland Diocese. Responding to the pleas of several popes that the church in the United States come to the aid of the church in Latin America, the Bishop of Cleveland sent a mission team to El Salvador, the smallest and most densely populated country in Central America. Two priests, Father Thomas Sebian and Father Dennis St. Marie, together with lay missionary Rosemary Smith, became Cleveland's first missionaries. Everything was different, but everything was exciting. Everything was adventurous. Everything was new. Everything was challenging. And I believe the most wonderful part about it was that they were so grateful. They were just so happy to have us down there. Uh, kind of as a joke, but I used to say, uh, the missions are for weak priests. Because if you go to the missions, you can see what you're doing, and the people are so grateful, you can see things grow. And that's so much more exciting than working in day after day in a parish, repeating the same old things, you know, sort of like saving the saved up here. There, we could see the advance, see things grow, see communities develop, uh, catechist programs advance and so forth. It was wonderful. It was exciting. I don't think it was overwhelming. The problems were overwhelming. You know, like in one month, 400 children died of measles, and uh, that was a concern. Um, there were so many things going around, you really didn't have time to be overwhelmed. Just uh, getting to go, you know, visit all the, the places, and there wasn't even a map. You know, so we didn't know where the villages were. And people would say, would you come to our village? We said, yes, but where are you? Well, just here, we'll come in and we'll go with you. And uh, we'd go so far in a jeep and then they'd have horses and we'd go in and, and uh, find the village. Since 1964, the people of El Salvador and the people of Cleveland have been sharing their gifts with each other. For the gifts we have received, the Church of Cleveland would like to say to the Church of El Salvador, gracias. In 1964, El Salvador was a rather quiet and peaceful country. Since then, political and social changes have led to much civil unrest and violence. Thousands of people have lost their lives, including the Archbishop of San Salvador, Oscar Romero. On the night of December 2nd, 1980, Cleveland missionaries Sister Dorothy Kazel and Jean Donovan along with marital missionary Sister Eta Ford and Sister Maura Clark, were numbered among the casualties of civil strife. Brought together in so many ways, the people of El Salvador and Cleveland were now joined in sharing a common grief. They both worked in um, several communities, starting from scratch, starting out with little celebrations of the word, and it, it was really impressive the work that they did. I think in terms of the whole history of the mission here, it's like the history of the Church of Cleveland met and started to be entwined with the history of the Church of El Salvador. And so there's a, a kind of inevitability that there would, the history of violence here would enter into the history of the Church of Cleveland. And I think it, it's kind of a focal point to say how we're accompanying their church in this <coughs> experience and that it got to the extreme of, of the deaths of the women. Missionaries are people who learn to adapt. There is a new language, a different climate. Both are realities which take some getting used to. Things are much 
more spontaneous, I think, here. What happens is they come in the morning for a funeral uh, that very afternoon, whereas in the States, it's a two or three day process. Um, also, I think one of the other things that I really find is a difference is uh, just the amount of movement you need uh, to, to get to do the basic kinds of work that we do. Um, you know, to drive 50 minutes to, to say mass and 50 minutes back is something I, you know, takes a lot more out of you than I expected. Um, what happens is, is uh, you find yourself all of a sudden just very tired. And uh, one of, I think, uh, you know, when it comes to the differences, um, that's uh, one of the physical things I've noticed. It's not anything, it's, it's a difference. I, I, I think it's great. I like it. Uh, we have one canton that is uh, of probably a 45 minute walk up a hill. And uh, when you come back from there, you feel like you've really done a day's work. The differences of my ministry are, are probably not as great as what I anticipated. Um, the biggest thing as I, as I came was the language, of course. It's always a challenge to try to be able to communicate. But now I'm beyond the fact, uh, beyond the, uh, the point of just simple communication, and you really want to get, be able to get into the people's lives to be able to, um, to try to show them how God is really living in their experience. Uh, and so that's where the challenge is, to know somebody well enough and to be able to express that well enough so that you can um, be, well, that's what I believe a pre one of the jobs of a priest is, to show uh, that God is alive and well in the life of a human being and to get them to realize that as well. A new language can be learned and hot weather can be endured, but getting used to a new way of living is an even greater challenge. Poverty is more the rule than the exception in El Salvador, and violence and death are inescapable realities of everyday life. There's a civil war going on here, which in a, in a lot of ways doesn't necessarily touch the majority of the people directly. But the, the side effects of the war are present every day. Unemployment, um, uh, the regular acceptance of of violence that is creeping into everybody's lives to be able to deal with their problems, to deal with the stresses of life in Central America and especially in this country of El Salvador. I think the, um, the church and the role of faith in the life of a person is of the utmost value. And um, they have a lot of the groundwork to be able to accept that very, very well. Uh, but I think just as every, everybody, we need the, uh, the reinforcement of the Christian community, uh, the reinforcement of the church's ministers, and the reinforcement of um, the hierarchy as well to let these people know that uh, they can survive despite what they have to, fa to deal with and have to face every day. Every country produces its own culture, and in Salvadoran culture, religion and life are not easily separated. 95% of Salvadorans are Catholic, and religious feast days are likely to be civic holidays as well. When the parish celebrates its feast day, the shops close, children stay home from school, and the whole town celebrates the fiesta. celebration it's kind of good here because it's the end of the of the farming season uh, when they are uh, um, harvesting and so uh, the harvest the giving thanks for for the harvest uh, we have what we call a around this time we have a fiesta de maiz which is a, a fiesta of the harvest uh, when they get a chance to, uh, to celebrate thank God for uh, for the, the gifts that they've received and so too, then the the fiesta, our patronal feast here in, in Saragossa, um, the people have the opportunity to to integrate their their faith uh, with a kind of social 
a celebration uh, and interconnect us. We have many people who come back to Saragossa who have moved away, but they come back at the fiesta time uh, to, to reconnect uh, with Saragossa, to reconnect with their, with their rootedness they, uh, here in Saragossa, and to reconnect with their families, many of whom are, are still here. A grand session precedes the Mass as people from different neighborhoods bring their gift to the Virgin Mary. Padre Manuel Cordoba was strongly encouraged by Cleveland missionaries to pursue his studies for the priesthood. Now ordained, he has been invited by the Cleveland team at Saragossa to preach at the feast day mass in honor of Our Lady of the Pillar. In Chiralagua, it isn't fiesta time, but it's time for a party. Laura Ergo is part of the Cleveland Mission team there, and she's been working with the handicapped people in her parish, offering them support and assistance. This all grew out of a project. Um, the youth ministry had asked if they could help in the work with the disabled. And um, what we started was we matched up pairs of the youth with a disabled child and asked them to visit the child once a week. And in those visits, they would, if the child was able to learn how to read or write, they were trying to teach that. They were taking toys to kind of animate the children and also trying to do exercises with the kids to help loosen up their muscles. Um, what we decided then is that it would be good to bring all the children together. And so what we're looking at doing is once a month having an activity. This is the first time we're doing this, and today we just started with a party to celebrate Dia de la Raza. But in the future, we'll probably be doing maybe some educational kinds of things, uh, maybe some exercise kinds of things. Getting young people involved in the work of the parish is excellent preparation for the future. Since there is just one priest for every 10,000 Salvadoran Catholics, the church must depend on the dedication of its lay members. Chilo is a young man in Chirilagua. He and his wife Blanca have two young children. To supplement their income, they have turned their house into a grocery store. And when he isn't working, Chilo is probably at the church helping out. Chilo is one of the younger members of our staff here. Um, he actually is on staff with the Small Farm Development Bank and works with some of the campesinos in a program that is designed to help them rent land um, and at a lower price get seed and fertilizer and that that is needed. Um, it's a program run by, the, by three Salvadoran uh, men and is designed basically for those who are most in need and do not have land to farm. Chilo also is very active in our parish in a number of programs, including the First Communion program, the sacramental programs. He's one of our First Communion teachers. Um, he works with the youth group and is very well respected among the young people um, and demonstrates some charism and authority with them that they seem to respect him um, and he can talk on their level. They understand what he's saying. From the time Cleveland missionaries first arrived in El Salvador, they have understood that their work would have to be shared by the women and men in their parishes. Training of lay leaders has been a significant contribution of the Cleveland mission team. And now, the efforts made in that direction are paying rich dividends in the lives of generous lay workers. Well, I guess basically the very reason why we came down here was because of the, the lack of priests, which was the main reason why 20, almost 25 years ago the diocese sent missionaries here, priests, religious, and lay people. Uh, that's the main reason, is, is if we want to have Christian communities that are alive and are doing something, somebody has to be leaders there and somebody has to be uh, celebrating, doing the celebrations of the word and, and uh, 
just doing all of those different ministries that we're in, involved in, in the cantons. And so that's why we have so many lay leaders. You know, the reason uh, why I'm a priest is, is, to, is to build the, the local community. And uh, I think it's a blessing when, when the people really take over those jobs, as you say, they're traditionally were done by priests. And if they want the church, which is uh, you know, the living and breathing body of Christ in our midst to, to be alive, then they, they're responsible for that. They're for responsible for the, for the life, the Christian life in their community. If Cleveland missionaries have taught the people of El Salvador the need to take responsibility for their church, the people of El Salvador have also taught Clevelanders how much lay leaders can contribute to the vitality of the church. It's a valuable lesson for the church in the United States, where priests and religious continue to be in shorter supply. It's difficult getting out to some of the cantons, um, especially because of the rainy season, which we're in right now. All of the sun is shining. Um, and so it, it's, it's quite a challenge, and I don't think we'd be able to do it except for the catechists that we have in each canton. They follow through then on the classes for the children and the other three charlas or talks for the adults. Um, I try to get around to all the First Communion classes at least once to visit the classes. And again, it's more to show interest in the children. Um, they, they seem to get a kick out of it when you ask them questions. And my idea of church, I think, has developed in seeing the way these people work within the communities, the way they come together to celebrate the word, the way they come together to pray the vigils they have when someone has died. It's, I guess, very, in some ways, very different than in Cleveland in the sense that the people are themselves taking a lot of initiative in going out and seeking out others and welcoming, welcoming them into the church, into the body of Christ, and in the sense that they go out and prepare the um, couples for marriage, they prepare the parents of the babies for baptism. Um, it makes our work, I think, easier because, because of the size of this parish. It would be very difficult to make it to all the cantons to do all the training. Um, and I think it would not be done as well. Dice también sus familiares, los niños y hijos presentes, que todos pueden... In some ways, the work of the church is the same all over the world. This sick call required a jeep ride as far as the roads would permit, and then a half-hour walk up a steep hill. It was probably the last time the sick man would see a priest. El Señor Jesucristo está a tu lado para defenderles. Que Él vaya delante de ustedes para guiarles y vaya detrás de ustedes para ayudarles. Que Él vele por ustedes y que Él les sostenga en sus enfermedades y sufrimientos. Y la bendición de Dios Todopoderoso, Padre, Hijo y Espíritu Santo, desciende sobre todos. Amén. Bueno, bueno, visitar con usted, por fin. Lo siento que no podía ven, venir el jueves, pero sí, sí, estamos, sí. ¿Está tomando medicina o no? Oh, no. ¿Qué tipo de...? Every day, there is the celebration of the Eucharist. But sometimes this means taking the church to where the people are. The work of the church is the same. But the way the work is done can be very different and very tiring. When you join up with people that are heading to the same once a month mass that you are, and they're dressed in their best clothes that they can afford, and they're in an attitude of celebration already, they're happy, so happy to see us. And we're so happy to see them. I think it's a, it's a joy-filled time. That's, I think it takes a lot of, it might look like drudgery to go that far over, you know, no road or to, uh, you know, climb or walk in the heat. But usually it's not. Usually I. I found that it's almost, um, I can't say refreshing, you come back tired, but you come back rewarded by these beautiful people.
Spiritual needs are important, but so are material and physical needs. Missionaries learned a long time ago that it's difficult to preach the gospel to somebody with an empty stomach. Being a missionary means helping to fill the body and the mind. Some 500 children receive a Catholic education in the parish school at La Libertad, where Salvadoran sisters, some government paid teachers and some privately paid teachers, work actively with the Cleveland missionaries. Sometimes that requires help from the people up north. Support comes from several Cleveland parishes, parishes outside our diocese, and some individuals. And through that program, we're able to offer the students the money to pay their tuition for the year, plus money to help buy their uniforms and notebooks, et cetera, whatever they might need. Even though many Salvadorans have an opportunity to go to school for at least some part of their life, there are still many who have never learned to read or write. More than six out of ten Salvadorans living in rural areas are illiterate. Since many of those who have served on the mission team have had experience in teaching, it was natural that they would set up programs to teach reading, writing, and arithmetic. We have a couple of literacy programs in the parish. One is called the Alphalet Program, and another is called the Despertar Guanaco Program, run by two different groups, but uh, with the same object in mind to teach people how to read and write. We have, uh, for the Alphalet Program, teachers trained uh, to give classes in their own communities at the hour most suitable for the people who uh, can't attend school. And that's not only for the children, it's for the adults also. And we like to get as many adults as we can into the program to. Uh, help them out also. Give a person a fish and he eats for a day. Teach a person to fish and he eats for a lifetime. Food distribution programs in the mission parishes are coupled with health education classes. Before receiving food, a person is asked to attend a lecture or charla about health and nutrition. In this way, both immediate and long-term solutions are provided. Each person has to bring their children in every three months to be weighed. And so besides just getting education, the food is supposed to be helping the child to grow and the food is supposed to be going to the children. And if they don't come in and get weighed every three months, they can't get their food. Because we have to see that the child is developing with the food. And if not, why not? The most important part is that they know what to do with that food how to prepare it, and more important, how to take care of the health of their children through proper nutrition. Then after they get their cards, they go into the storeroom, they're given their food, and they do pay. They pay one cologne, 25 centavos, which is probably about 30 cents. But they pay so that they have some kind of responsibility and so that it's just not a, a free lunch. They're actually putting something into it and they're taking some responsibility for it. Doctors in private hospitals are scarce in El Salvador, and only the wealthy are able to afford them. While there are some public agencies, many of the poor will never see a hospital or visit a doctor. Health clinics like the one in La Libertad supplement government assistance and provide medical assistance and medicine at a price that even the poor can afford. The clinic operates uh six days a week uh, with coverage, uh, five days with metal, medical care and five days with dental care. Um, we have a medical clinic that gives uh, attention to children from birth to 12 years old. Our dental clinic is uh, open to any age person from children to adult. Uh, we call ourselves an ass uh, assistance clinic. That is, we do charge a very minimal rate, which is well or for a, an examination of a child, uh, which includes the medicine if we happen to have it. And we try to maintain as much as possible through uh, donations and money to buy at uh, quantity costs and so on. But we do uh, ask for a, a, a small donation from the uh, person, uh, keeping with our idea of uh, honoring the dig, just giving everything out to them. 
celebrating as bringing the sacraments of the church to the people, preaching, teaching, and educating, distributing food and medicine. In all these ways, the Cleveland Mission Team, lay women, religious women, and priests have been walking with the people of El Salvador. They have shared both their joy and their sorrow, their riches and their wants, their life and their death. In the words of Bishop Pella, as we look back in gratitude, we forward in hope that we may maintain this relationship through personnel, prayer, and financial sacrifice. In 1964, the Church of Cleveland responded to the plea to come to the aid of in Latin America. We have been able problems we encountered, and many difficulties remain. But as Sister Dorothy Casel once said, it only a hope, a little bit of love. Looking, most would admit that we have brought more than a little bit of each. I believe the greatest thing the mission team has done is to stay there. I think that the day uh, will come when the most uh, notable contribution to the, of the Cleveland mission to Latin America will have been these recent years. Our mission team stayed where we could have folded our tent and come home. We found that, I believe, uh, is the real sign of the diocese's commitment that allowed us to stay and of the will of the people that uh, really are there with the missionaries through thick and thin. It's like a marriage through the good and the bad. And we have the good and the exciting times, and they've had the tough times, but I think that their contribution is the greatest. And I'm very, very proud of what they have done just by staying there. But not to say that they haven't done many other wonderful things in addition, but the greatest contribution is that they've stayed there. They've been a witness. And in return, in return, we have received a hundredfold. El Salvador has given back to Cleveland the privilege of sharing in their poverty and their struggle. In El Salvador, we have learned some of the most important lessons of the gospel. Lessons of caring for people and trusting in God. We have seen the church grow strong with the help of lay leaders. We have learned the meaning of Jesus' words, suffer the little ones to come unto me, for of such is the kingdom of heaven. For all these lessons we have learned, the church of Cleveland says, gracias. Gracias, El Salvador. You have given us much. <laughs>